uh, mean automatically increase of, uh, of increase of profit, which is another huge simplification. I mean, a firm, a rationality of firm may be much wider than in increasing of its interest. Um, we basically tell the students, mm, you don't have to, as a business person, you don't have to worry, or even as an individual, you don't have to worry about the ethical impacts of your deeds. So you are best off minding your own business, uh, going after your own utility, and whatever you do to the outside world will be transformed and transmuted by invisible hand into common good. So you don't really have to, we don't have to talk about ethics. Because whatever you do, the invisible hand of the markets will um, turn your malicious interests, this is in the words of Bernard Mandeville, into common good. So it's a little bit like uh, St. Paul in the New Testament, he describes a similar thing, but exactly opposite. Paul says, I want to do good, but fuck it, I, 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 did, I ended up making evil. Yeah, you know this passage from, from the New Testament. Uh, the invisible hand of the market is exactly the opposite. I wanted to do evil, but fuck it, I did it again. I contributed to common good. <laughs> so it's impossible to be malicious in this in this system, which is uh, which is uh, in medieval times this was something ascribed to uh, to, to, to to the role of, of the devil as the sort of evil which whatever he does it is turned into. Common, common good, just like in, in Faust. Now, um, uh, so we talked about we talked about um, um, the ideological. You don't have to care about the results of your deeds. Um, there are other values in the textbooks of economics which are absolutely fine. I agree with them. For example, freedom. We have a huge emphasis on freedom. Freedom is a huge value in economics. Not so much solidarity or compassion or, or things, which is fine. I mean, I, I like the freedom one too, but there we could have chosen so many other um, uh, qualities of life that would also work. And my point is not to say that all of those ethics are bad, but that there is a very strong ideological component. So freedom is a huge, uh, it's a huge um, value of economics, but it's not freedom in the philosophical sense. And most politicians also, when they talk about freedom, they mean this freedom in, uh, in, in an economic sense. Um, it is not a freedom in philosophical sense. It's a consumer and production freedom. <laughs> so all these values get in the body of economics uh, uh, and we do not question them. Now, of course, you will say, these are assumptions. And I say, yes, but we shouldn't then mix assumptions with, with beliefs. Um, when I make an assumption, it is a technical assumption that means that it isn't real. So, for example, when, when I want to calculate the, uh, the free fall of an object, I assume that friction of air doesn't exist. It's, of course, a stupid assumption because, of course, friction of air exists, everybody knows. If it wouldn't exist, we wouldn't be here. But it's actually useful to trick the reality. This is the method of science. Science never approaches reality directly. Science yeah. makes tricks. So you don't see, like, like uh, Neo in Matrix, uh, you don't see the formulas behind, right? So when I let this go down, what in fact happened is materialization of the three-form formula. But you don't see the formula, and you don't see the structure of things, you don't see inflation, you don't see um, the models directly. Yes. And that's the usage of force. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but in fact you believe that the, structure, the, 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 the matrix, the green lights that are sort of falling behind it, that's really what science wants to do. But we can't do it directly. We do uh, sort of a side trick. This is, this is um, comes from the archetype of the trickster, which is something that was described by, by Jung quite nicely. It was the, um, the, the, mo the oldest archetype of mankind is trickstery. Because when you're faced with an enemy that is stronger than you, in our, in our case, back in the days, this was nature. 
We could never attack nature directly. We had to make tricks. We had to invent traps. We had to, um, we had to, and we do it till today. So I approach the problem and I imagine as if I live in the world of Star Wars where friction of air doesn't exist. And it turns out to be a good, good, good myth to be used in this calculation. In fact, of course, there is no formula that materializes itself. Where would that formula be? Would it be hanging in the open space? Where is the formula for free fall? Or is it only, of course, in your brain? And you can't. So this is, this is actually something that works. Now, how does this function in economics? Let's assume that people like to wear yellow socks. Could we make that assumption? Yes, of course we can. But it doesn't sound very good. So let's assume that people, I don't know, whatever, people like to wake up in the morning and sing. What about, let's assume that human beings are rational, as good as the sock thing. Yeah, okay, so it's, let's human beings, that we, uh, you know, are, let's say, utility maximizing egoists, in, in, in short. And then they do, or we do, our mathematical model. Da, 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 da. Also, also realize that all these assumptions which we fairly criticize are only there because we want to calculate the model. If we didn't need the mathematics, these assumptions wouldn't have to be there. Or they could be debated. So one thing with these assumptions is that they are immovable. You can't take them away from, from economics because then the whole structure falls down. And second, they are not assumptions, but they are in fact belief structures. Why? Because this economist who sort of, let's say, invents this model based on these assumptions, this is fine, so far so good, there is, everything is legit. The problem is when in the evening he goes to the pub and he meets his friends who are philosophers, artists, sociologists, or journalists, and he says, you know what we discovered today? That human beings are rational utility maximizing uh, egoists. What? Not because the models work better with it. Oh. With what? Oh, they just, they're just elegant. Oh, so you turn the human being into an ele elegant, naive, very romantic image, and then suddenly the outcome is that you have elegant, uh, elegant form. That's the, but it's like if a physicist would come to the pub and say, you know what we discovered? We discovered that friction of air does not exist. So we as economists, we have a choice. Either it's an assumption, technical assumption, that is irrelevant with reality, which is fine, but in that case, we shouldn't be fighting with our friends that human beings are egoists. Because when you are advocating it in the pub, you are also saying, I believe, I have bought, in other words, I have fully bought the myths that I have created myself. <coughs> yeah, so we reject, of course, um, the older myths, and we create, so it's even worse, it's even worse uh, than with religious structure, because religious structure, you remember your parents would go to the church every Sunday, and they would say what it is that they believe. I believe in this and this and this and this, whatever. The, the, the importance of that was that you know that this is me, and this are my beliefs. I have some distance between me and my beliefs. Today, the problem is we have we don't believe we know, which is, of course, a home run of every ideology for it not to be um, questioned. So, so um, when you read Samuelson, you will read that uh, he wants to teach you to think like an economist. And immediately you must say, which one? Keynes, or Friedman, or Hayek, or Smith, or Schumpeter, or Marx, or Babylon, or or Weber, or Zizek, which, which one? Or, okay, Zizek's not an economist, but what about Marx? Is it, well, so, no. Which one do you want us to think like? And then, then the argument that I always suppose, well, you know, this, was, this is the common ground on which economists agree. If this, if anything, if you put all these big names in economics that I named that form our field, into one room, one thing they would never agree with would be samples. Immediately, I mean, half of them would criticize um, uh, 
I mean, this is quite imaginable for you, no? How you could probably not say that a shoe bedroom would not, not sign the book. Um, so, um, um, these, this, is, this is also how this mainstream... Um, so, my point is that in the body of economics, there is not a moral vacuum, but there is a very strong moral school, which I've tried to describe. Growth is important, and, and all these sort of things which, you, which, 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 which we read. Now, let me, let me put in a little, little, little funny example of uh, how assumptions work vis-a-vis -vis the technical, uh, mathematical, usually, structure within. What we do is we suppress the soft part of economics into the outer rim. We suppress the soft into the assumptions. And then the inside of the model looks extremely hard. Is there anything fuzzy about human behavior? Well, structure it in a way uh, uh, that you can calculate it. So you have to get rid of all the soft disease and you put them into assumptions. Yeah, so human being. Utility maximizers, uh, rational, mathematically uh, approachable creatures. Uh, the process looks stunning because it looks, because you only, most of the people only see the results of the models. That's the visible structure. The soft religious component of that model is hidden underneath a structure that nobody talks about. Okay, now, now the example. There, in, if you've read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know what number 42 means. So there was this uh, civilization and they wanted to finally know the answer to the question of meaning of life, universe, and everything. And they were sick and tired of philosophers always and you know, people quarreling about the same thing for thousands of years. So they construct this computer. And this computer is the size of the earth and they say, we want you to, 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 to tell us the answer to the ultimate meaning of life, universe, and everything. So this computer says, yes, I can do it. It will take me two million years because it's a little bit complicated, but I will do it. Okay, so after 200, two million years, the whole multiverse gathers to, to hear the answer. So the computer wakes from his mathematical slumber and says, okay, I have the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything, finally. And they say, okay, can you, can you tell us the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything? And he says, yes, the answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything is definitely 42. You know, everybody was a little bit surprised. But the machine said, yes, it's definitely 42. I've t-tested it. I've done all the tests. I've in included all the, all the shocks. It's 42. Now, what's there? Isn't this exactly how we would like science to be? And why did 42 not make sense? You tell me. Why did 42 not make sense? The question was OK. It was a technical answer to a soft question. The question about meaning of life doesn't make sense if you don't know the process of, it, of, of, of setting aside the assumptions. So, um, 42 is a scientific, objective, mathematical, independent uh, answer to the meaning of life, universe, and everything. Of course, the genius of Douglas Adams is that this, in fact, describes our situation very much. Uh, and I claim that in economics, what we have been structured is exactly 42. 42 doesn't make sense because we don't see the, the soft. We don't see the model. But uh, assumption is not only part of the model. Assumption is the model. So whatever you assume while, while practicing your calculation, uh, that's also something that you have to believe. And the fervency with which the debate is held uh, uh, shows that the, this ideological component is, is really replacing uh, religion, which is OK. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, just something that we shouldn't pretend that we are um, involved with. Uh, with uh, sort of uh, independent physics-like field. Oh, this also surprised me. I'm not against you know mathematics as long as there is not just mathematics and economics. Um, but why did we choose? There's also many different types of economics. Why did we choose physics as our role model in economic methodology? 
I mean, physics, intuitively speaking, why, why not biology to start with? Why we rather, when you open a textbook of economics, it looks like a physics textbook from a distance. Um, why did we, why, why, for what reason was it economics? Why didn't we inspire ourselves after moral philosophy or, or even perhaps, I don't know, sociology or political science? I was even provoking my colleagues at the Czech faculty. I was saying, you know, maybe we should start with putting economics, teaching economics as a subset of sociology. Because that movement alone would make us understand that there's a society around uh, markets and, and, and whatnot. And, um, let me end with a final thought. I am not against, so I call this invisible hand, I call it the unorchestrated orchestrator. This is leading us into the future. This is telling the economy and the politicians what to do because the markets wouldn't like it. So, so, uh, so we are led by this unorchestrated orchestrator, which is my synonym for the invisible hand of the market. In the debate whether economics is normative or not, I say economics is normative backwards. It doesn't allow you to give it your normative norms. You must accept its normative norms. So you must accept my normative statement that human beings are egoistic. That's, that's, this is how we dealt with the, we put the normative statement into is. Is human being rational is the question that mankind has been solving for thousands of years. And economics solves the problem with just putting the question mark away. Human being is rational. That's the, the part where the soft is. How can you say that and, and believe that? Uh, that's where the normative are. And then you can produce 42s or 1.6s as much as, much as, you, as, much as you want. Um, so, um, uh, uh, I believe in the invisible hand, but not of the markets. I believe in the invisible hand of humanity. Somehow, when uh, the society becomes too bureaucratic, and we were part of the same empire, Kafka is born. And he sort of shatters uh, the glamour of bureaucracy in, in, in a couple of uh, books. When the population is becoming too business oriented, a generation of hippies is born. Uh, when when the, the earth gets overused, we have this green movement. So there is sometimes uh, economics is saved by art, because otherwise it would go down. Sometimes business saves art, sometimes art saves politics. So we have these hands by which we help each other, but how we managed to sort of steal or privatize that aspect of the society to be true of economics and economics only, I do not know um, why uh, and how uh, this happened. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready, of course, for, for your thoughts. Thank you. Start building a slightly good model. Yeah. 
and didn't go through the quantum uh, and, and, and the general theory of revolution. Because the mathematics used in physics is completely different. Yeah. So this is another question also. It's not just mathematics, yes or no. It's what sort of mathematics. <coughs> and there you come to this other, uh, again, you get back to philosophy at the end of the day. Like what, what, sort of, what sort of economic, I mean, linear or non-linear, how, how, how shall we do this? They don't even, they don't even start there is a possibility of intertwining. So a function that, that needs to, uh, it's like two functions that are like intertwined. I don't know the English term for this. Yeah. So that one um, variable and the other variable are linked, that you cannot, that you cannot separate them. Yeah. So linked variables. Yeah. They don't even go for that. Yeah. So, so, so this is of course, so the mathematics that we have is, is question, questionable but not questioned. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> The rest we, I mean, I don't know how it is here, but uh, the faculty that I travel, the soft parts of economics are going to, are extremely decreasing in, in minority. And again, I have nothing against mathematics. I did it really well and, and I enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, it's just that uh, then we are creating autistic fuck idiots who yeah. don't really know. I mean, if you actually, if you actually look at it, all we do in our textbook is, in microeconomics, we maximize utility. Yeah? We spend 95% of the time. Any ever defined what utility is? By the way, for rigorous science, nowhere in the textbook would it say what utility is. Utility is what people do. Oh, well, that's a tautology then, isn't it? And even that basic mathematical thing is, is, is based on fundamental tautology. You know the tautology of the maximization theorem and also the tautology of the natural selection of the markets. Let's start with the second one, which is easier. We believe that markets select the best, best uh, players, right? Which one is, how now test this hypothesis? Okay, so the hypothesis is markets select the best players. <coughs> test it. Quickly. How would you test such a hypothesis? Whoever survives is the, the best. Yes, but uh, yes. How do we find, how do we test it? So we would have two firms, and we would have to somehow know that firm A is better than firm B, and then let the market process, and if market process chooses firm A, then the market process chose a better one. Is this experiment possible? And has it ever been done? No. It's a fundamental tautology because as the market select the best one, which one is the best one? The ones that market selected. So that is a fundamental tautology, which uh, doesn't make any sense. And something similar happens with the human beings maximize their utility at all times. Uh, okay, here, what is maximize? Always look for the strange words, foreign words. Maximize is a strange word. Um, uh, utility is a strange word. Yeah. So, um, what do you mean by utility? Well, uh, do you also mean the utility of the children? So the mother who sacrifices herself for her child, is she egoist? Yeah, yeah you can also you know, look at it this way. And then the word becomes a little bit absurd, doesn't it? I mean, you wouldn't exactly go around without saying that the mother was egoist for killing herself uh, so that her baby would live, would you? You would probably get a smack on your face from somebody. It's the same thing I always imagine what would happen if Roy this is a of great psychoanalysis, but I'm well, as critical as what would happen if Roy would come to some you know wood chopper somewhere in the deep forest, uh, have his white gown and tell him, you know what, you want to fuck your mother and kill your dad. <laughs> but you don't know about this. You know what would happen to Roy? I think the hammer would just box and don't ever come back here. Pervert. Yeah, because this is again another type of ideology that we for some reasons accept. Maybe Freud had a problem like this, but, but this is something that, you know, to a normal person who is not in, 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 in fused in the ideology, like gifts, you know? So in economic textbook, gifts are a paradox. Yes, but only to those who've been studying these books. To everybody else, gift what? What is it? Oh, paradox. I can gift. I can gift. <laughs> But you're not you're ma you're maximizing your utility and you, by giving gifts. And, of course I'm not. That's what's called gift. But in economics, oh my god. 
look and get confused because this is a paradox because we've been learning for four years that kids don't exist, but they do. <laughs> there is no such thing as a free lunch. That's another thing that we believe. So how about if we would say there is nothing like free dinner? Now that's a little bit more <laughs> But it has to be lunch because it's a business lunch, right? But dinners, I had a lot of free dinners and I gave a lot of free dinners because I'm a human being. I don't calculate the utility of inviting that person for dinner. Yeah, so, uh, so, so, so yeah, why physics? Why, why, why physics? <coughs> Just because it's harder? I mean, no, we really... Physics, why physics? Well, no, no, generally we are inspired by, by physics. But not to the degree that a physics... Yeah, not even in the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. Oh, this is definitely physics, applied physics to yeah. economy. Yeah. I mean, there is no error, there, is no, there are no calculated errors. I mean, whenever you see an economic equation or whatever they bring up, there is absolutely no value of error. It's it, it is this. Yeah. You see, this we calculate, it's precise. Yeah. And then nothing is... It's, it's in modern economy. The it's value of error is 90%. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's modern mythology. It's self-created modern, which is fine. I mean, you cannot exist ideology. And you cannot go into a neutral ideological ground. But I'm just saying that we should treat economists like any religious minority. You know, you fool. You know, I'm absolutely fine with that. You are free to publicly speak your opinion and gather, and you can exercise all your religious rights, but you know, maybe don't teach my children. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course, with you, but uh, in, in, some, in some way, in some way. Can I have uh, the, the other question? Unless somebody else has a question? The other question was to the more close to the utility thing. Yeah. Um, so my mom is a feminist. Yeah. She was there to me after a while, she found out that feminism, yes, it's fun, but the two, in a way, true feminism would also include housekeeping. It doesn't mean that the woman has to do housekeeping. It's one of the parts of the problem to the part of housekeeping. So whichever comes first, that's the thing. Um, because you have a devaluation of the household. So how, how children are educated at home. And how the household actually, the value of a household. Because obviously we all know this, that somehow cooking at home is cheaper than going out. So, in a way, a household has more value, so not just from education, but more value from practical things like someone says it stays at home and cooks and cleans. Um, then if somebody would go to work so they can use the whole way to eat outside and rent somebody who will clean for them. So in a way, you lose all of that and modern economy just doesn't just doesn't uh, equate this into GDP at all. Yeah. I mean, it's actually negative to the GDP yeah. because the wife stays at home yeah. and there is no money transaction. So or the partner, if you're some of a feminist, you should say the wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the partner stays at home. So that you don't get smacked at home. <laughs> by the invisible hand of your mother. <laughs> but it's also funny because when we imagine the invisible hand, by the way, now that we enter, this is, we are entering fully economic mythology, and I'm just made more. The mythology of the invisible hand, how do you imagine it in your head? It's a disembodied hand. It doesn't have a central mechanism. It serves no purpose. It's, it's, um, it's like uh, the opposite of a zombie. Maybe like a zombie, like this hand that crawls in Adam's <laughs> yeah. So, so it's also the imagery of the of the invisible hand is a little bit, little bit uh, skewed there, there also. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, this is this also happens with morality. We have this was Ivan Illich, the, uh, the the philosopher from Austria, not far from here, who talks about uh, how institutions suddenly care m m moral blame. So let's put it this way: uh, in the past, it was. And, or in Christianity, to take another value school. It was um, important for you to take care of your parents, for the sake, for the poor, for the orphans. Now you don't have to do that anymore because that moral duty has been extra skeletonized to a social net. So we live in a time when institutions carry more and more moral blame and also moral, moral, uh, moral, moral duties. 
So uh, also you can see that one way of growth is that we sell out our, ourselves. So what do I mean? Uh, this growth that we're having, my thesis is that it isn't our growth, that we've harvested and we stole it from the past, fossil fuels that we now suddenly know how to use, but that's <coughs> energy of the past. We steal it from the future, fiscal stimuli, etc., etc. We steal it from um, the horizontal. We Europeans are mainly this rich because we stole half of this from half the world. And that really boosted our GDP. And we are now doing a little bit better with international trade, which is with international trade, which is very beneficial for the poor, but much more beneficial for the rich. The rich countries, who are price dictators, take 99% of the, uh, the, the surplus value for, in that transaction. Yeah. So uh, that's how we generate growth and, and, and inventions. And another source of growth is outselling. The, the within. An example, communications 30 years ago was between two people and you, you rarely needed the market to, 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 to communicate. So we would send letters, so that was a little bit using of, 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 of some other people, but otherwise it was you and me, we didn't need the market. Today communication is turning into telecommunication and 90% of my communication is I need to employ a thousand people to make that call. So when I'm calling you, I am employing lawyers, uh, artists, PRists, technicians, cleaning ladies, I don't know what, to make that call. In other words, I uh, have extra skeletonized communication. I have given communication from something that was personal into the market. There's nothing wrong with that. And that telecommunication wave gave us, I don't know, 20, 30% of GDP exactly because we sold it, not in a bad way, but we sold communications from personal to market. The result is that we don't write letters anymore. Uh, in the beginning, why you had emails was so that you can write your friends a letter that will arrive faster, and that didn't happen anymore. Remember when we had these um, the, the, the positives, you know, the family came from holiday, we would put it up there, it was very expensive, clumsy and thing. Now everybody has a data projector, nobody does these things anymore at home. Or how many times do you actually do and play pictures from your, your summer holidays? But, um, but uh, yeah, so um, how did I get there? <laughs> this is always, this is always, this is always a problem. Yeah, so we, 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 we make GDP growth by selling the inside. You can also sell cooking. You can also sell cleaning. You can also sell bringing up your children. You can also sell uh, um, sex. So basically, we sell the family. Uh, yeah, but I don't mean this in a negative way. Yeah? So this is not my criticism. I don't have a better word or gave away or trans transport it <coughs> to, to, yeah, the, 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 the role of the family as a social unit is no longer so important. The question is whether this is, <coughs> this is, this is good or bad. I mean, I, uh, uh, I think it's better if we have something that sociologists clean, called clean relationship. Because, and that is the relationship, not for economic purposes, but for the relationship itself. So in one way it's liberating, in another way you can of course look at it traditionally, that the traditional values that used to be. My philosopher teacher said that he had a grandmother always, who needed money only twice a year, for taxes and for salt. But otherwise everything was sort of shared in the, in the community. So, and again, I'm not, I don't want to go back to living on the, on the, on the forest, but we just should be aware of the mechanism um, that it is doing. It's like Charlie Chaplin when, in modern times when he's screwing the machine. Remember, the more machine-like he is, the more successful he is. The moment he, he hiccups or he wants to eat, he wants to do something human, he is left behind the process. And, um, uh, uh, and then uh, he even gets swallowed by the machine, but he still keeps working on it. Yeah, you remember this is a great image. <coughs> something soft again coming to something soft being crushed by these hard metallic uh, wheels. But we so something that was supposed to serve us swallowed us. So I'm just saying that this is something that we should be uh, quite aware, and we should openly debate these things. Yes, sorry. A related yeah. question. Um, you're you're very critical of of economic growth in general, but would you support would you either support the idea of degrowth 
<laughs> or would you would you rather defi redefine the concept of welfare in society, or yeah. would you would you redefine GDP as I don't know gross national happiness or something like yeah. uh, similar? I, I'm not against growth. I just uh, I I just I'm against critical artificial. critical to economic growth GDP. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can I upgrade you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. We live in a society where assumption is that the growth of the society is only the GDP growth. Yeah, exactly. Growth. Yeah. What about the Bhutan model? Second factor, national capital. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, actually, these questions are connected. We don't know if we are happier cooking at home or outside. Uh, maybe in the beginning it looks cool, but then somehow uh, we also miss them. So, for example, we've lost boredom. Yeah, boredom is dead. So there are also new values that will be produced. If there are values that die, and we will talk about, oh, do you remember the time when there was actually boredom? Uh, and of course, boredom is bad, but it had some moments to it. Now, GDP. So, how should I? This is a big topic of mine. So, for example, I, um, I, I don't criticize GDP growth. I'm just saying that it's become our religion. That we don't really, it's not a crisis of capitalism. When we don't believe in capitalism, I think, when I'm talking with my right-wing uh, friends, sort of the new liberals. I say, it's not really capitalism. In capitalism, I believe also. I believe in freedom. I believe in that. I believe that, that the system that we have is not perfect, but I believe it's the best, is the most fertile ground for growth, democratic capitalism, market democracy. Best system that are fertile grounds, nothing more but a fertile ground for growth. But growth of freedom, growth of friendship, growth of art, growth of I don't know what. Uh, not just economics, but also economics. Today, what, and this is okay, for what I criticize today is a subject-object reversal master-slave uh, swap, that we today, in fact, I think we believe, I think this is what you actually believe, and me and majority of the people, is that growth is a conditio sine qua non of market capitalism. <coughs> if we don't have growth, it collapses. It doesn't collapse without growth. We haven't had growth for thousands of years. We only started measuring 136 years ago. Before that, you didn't really care whether you have 42% more than... than it's, it's 42s anyway. Yeah, because without the context, I mean, 1.6% growth is... So this is what I love. Also, you will see my colleagues in TV, this debate about like, whether we are normative or positive. Uh, what's the inflation rate in, 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 in the month of May? Oh, in the month of May, it was 1.5. And immediately, is that good or bad? Oh, no, it's very good, it's very good, it should be much worse, and da, 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 da. or he said, no, it's bad, it should be less, or it should be more so. You know, economists talk about good and evil all, all the time. Uh, the, the very, yeah, but okay, growth. So, what we've, um, uh, I was having this academic debate with my friends, and they told me, you know, we like what you say, but it's very naive and very romantic. I said, yeah, 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 of course, as much as I can. But then I thought, wait a minute, actually, so, no, stop, pause here. Who's romantic in this room? Who is naive? Who believes that human behavior is approachable by mathematical formula? I mean, that is naive. And who, who, who believes that human beings are definitely rational? And you don't even question that. I think that's very romantic and naive. And then I thought, wait a minute, one more thing. Where did you take the assumption that economic growth, this is how these assumptions into practical political debate, which we have till today. Where did you take it that GDP should primarily grow? What, what, what is the, is, did you dream about it? Did you read it in the Bible? Is it in the sky? Did your models ever suggest that? Which sort of a dark hole did you, did you, did you that it should be one, two, three percent every year? And you've turned that into an assumption. Wishful thinking. I always wish at these conferences that I would have a little button and it would say, always, wouldn't it be nice? So, you know. <laughs> and this is wishful thinking. If you listen very carefully, when you get bored in these uh, economic conferences, just, you know, try to, how many, it would be better if we would grow, you know. Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> Government should decrease the level of bureaucracy. Wouldn't it be nice? But, but uh, I'm saying to them, building the, Believing that GDP should always grow and building our models upon it is as stupid as building a ship under the assumption that favorable winds will always blow. That is A, stupid, <coughs> because they don't always blow. For example, now, it's not that I don't, I'm not against growth. 
I'm just saying that, you know, wake up and it, there is no problem. It, it's happening. It's actually, and on the other hand, I think it's a, it's a, so in human life, this is important to me. In human life, there are values, many, many values. Some values have a number, this pen, this jacket. Some values do not have a number. One is not better than the other. So my house, my books, they all have a number, price. And then there are other values that do not have a number. Uh, the beauty of the horses, uh, the quality of shampoo that you, that you meet during the day, etc., etc., etc. Happiness, for example. Uh, now, no matter how good your calculation is, you'll always come up with a result that will be leaping on one leg because part of your equation will be missing. No matter how genius your mathematics would be. Because you cannot include all the stuff. And that is the problem. We fetishize the number. We sort of, and that's what I always say. If we want to be rigorous in our models, this is my practical suggestion. With every assumption you take, you should put it in the percentage of probability that that assumption is right. So, okay, let's start building a model. Let's start, uh, human beings are rational. I'd give that 50 50. <coughs> sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. We don't really know. 50 50. All right, next assumption. Human beings can see their utility. They, they can, they, very often human beings don't feel their utility, they only feel the change of it, so that, I mean, this, this whole is useless, it's this. but let's say 60, 40. Next assumption, human beings prefer their interest to others. I'd say, I don't know, 70, 30. Just this process is this helpful. And before we start constructing a model, we would know that we are moving on 8% probability sphere. Our problem is that we have completely neglected, so if you want to be rigorous, but then you have to be rigorous all the way. You can't say that this is the answer when clearly you have not included some of the most important factors that matter in our life. So some of this is going in the direction of giving numbers to things that didn't have numbers before. For example, carbon emissions is a good example of that, yeah? Giving it again to the market. And it functions, and I'm not criticizing carbon emissions, only philosophically, I'm asking my question, okay, so do we really want to give numbers to all values? Where will it stop? Will you charge me for smiling at you, or will we give me a minus point if I, if I tell you something that's critical? Um, and the problem is that if the more things we, and so, my question is yes, index, happiness index, but why does it have to be a number? Why does, why does he have to be, well, how useful it is for me to know that I'm 4.2% happier than last year? Well, but uh, gross you national know. happiness index does not only include happiness. It, it, it yeah, 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 but, but, but it's understand. still a number, I agree, it's still a number. But you put a larger weight on, on some other, like sustainability yeah. and other things. It's things much better than GDP. Policy. GDP yeah. was actually never, and here I would even defend GDP. GDP was never meant to measure happiness or wealth. Mm -hmm. GDP was meant to measure economic uh, activity. Period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, in my theory, people don't actually care. Let's do this. I have to run to, to this Port Trosh, which I believe is a beautiful city. And uh, can I ask uh, afterwards? I also have to ask a couple of questions, yeah? Uh, so uh, you ask something. I'm a little bit sick. I was even thinking of canceling the whole thing, so I'm not as fast as, 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 as normally, because I might die the next day. <laughs> But it's going to be a good day today. Yes? Yeah, well, I would like to, uh, uh, with to, to, to the question, uh, what's the role of the economy actually? What, what is the main role of the economy in the world? Because maybe, uh, my assumption, maybe what the issue in, in the economy is true is actually to take care of yourself, not to take care of society. Yeah. Yeah. Just for Adam Smith, for example, which is the starter, of, he said, uh, for example, that workers should not be paid too much, only to to live uh, not decent, but only substantial. To, yeah, substantial live. And maybe <coughs> Friedman, for example, is not, not the same. I don't know. Um, so, uh, what today uh, economists believe is that we have to to. Uh, 
uh, have a society where everybody lives a decent life or they just don't care? I mean, what's their role? What they uh, we believe in, in growth capitalism and the role of economists is to make it so somewhat grow. Yeah, but the owner. This is the problem who owns GDP growth. Yeah, so the, the argument is, well, the poor, this triple down argument, but of course, before it triples down, the, the, the rich. Nothing trickles. And nothing really, and nothing, very, very small droplets. And I'm always saying to my right wing friends when they use this argument that we need growth in order to take care of the poor. I say, oh, this is the first time that I hear you care for the poor. <laughs> You know, firstly. And secondly, if you really want to help the poor, and they're much more healthy, growth is not a very economic way of doing this. Growth is not a very efficient means of, of poverty alleviation. I mean, um, uh, <coughs> uh, so it is, sorry, but it, 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 it's not distributed uh, in a way that you would expect. Perhaps. But, um, but, uh, for example, Churchill said that uh, when they asked him to cut the expenses for, for, for the country, yeah. he said, uh, so why we are we actually doing all this? What, what are we fighting for? What, what are we fighting for? Yeah. So, yeah. It's actually the uh, capitalization uh, only, you know, only goal for itself or what, what are we are doing? If you, if you, again, the argument in Japan is that they cannot grow. Actually, if you, if, even more provocatively, if you take all the advice from OECD, World Bank, IMF, ECB, whatever, Fed, what to do, what to do uh, uh, if you want to grow, because it's natural, uh, basically, now I'm simplifying a lot, the uh, advice is be like Japan. The opposite. Be, be more technology driven, be more hard, dedic work dedicated, study harder, have better infrastructure, have speed rail. All these have fiscal stimuli like Japan. Exactly like Japan. Of course, the joke is Japan hasn't been growing for the, for the for 30, 20, 30 years. And <coughs> even if we would be so efficient as, as um, Japan committing suicides when you get fired, even then we wouldn't grow. Or there would be a place. Now, what interests me in this debate rather is the following. There is this golden roof argument that you know Japan cannot grow because everybody already has two iPods, so nobody's going to take the third one even for free. Now, whether I agree with this or not is now irrelevant, what, but it's a very common explanation. <clears throat> what interests me is why do we read this as bad news? Because the fact that everybody already has two iPods and nobody wants a third one, that should be a hallelujah moment for capitalism. Okay, done, finito, um, enjoy, and just do it like this, pretty much, don't fuck it up, and bye. This is the home run, this is the golden stage, this is the, um, the, 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 the steady state that John Stuart Mill was talking about. This is what, uh, what Keynes talks about, the economic possibilities of our country. We will be so rich, we will no longer need economists as priests. We can finally do what we want. Talk with friends, spend things doing art, because you don't need to work that much anymore. Uh, but no, this is taken as bad news. So, in other words, this situation of Japan, or the explanation of the situation in Japan, it's good news, it's hallelujah, it's home run news for capitalism, but it's a tragedy for growth capitalism. And this is one way where you can see the ideological traits, is that we don't believe in capitalism, we believe in, in, uh, in uh, growth capitalism. Yes, I think I can take one last question. And, uh, okay, <laughs> you were first. Uh, so, as much as I understand you, Not somehow, but yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So the ideology comes first, and the research comes first, and then second. Because ideology is first, and then they make research, and the research is actually yeah. by the ideology. Uh, it's interpreted. Interpreted. Yeah. yeah. But when 
read the biographies of famous Nobel economists like uh, James Buchanan, Mr. Yeah. Friedman, Thomas Sowell, and so on. Uh, so they, they were basically explaining their own uh, ideological path. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they said that uh, they actually, the causal relationship was in a different way. It was a research work, and ideology came from, from the second way. Uh, they made the research work, or they saw the research work, yeah. they felt the consequences yeah. of the economy on themselves or on their wider uh, family, yeah. and then they shape their own ideology. Yeah. So maybe they have a, a so I'm saying uh, in this way, and uh, economists have ideology, but shift this ideological uh, uh, commitment into other ways, or in uh, other ways, when he sees the act. Yeah, um, but what other way is there? <laughs> so this is, this is the problem with, uh, of course, we have, so we have many schools, we have many approaches. We have the Austrian school, we have the Cambridge schools, we have the German historical, we have the institutional school. We have many, 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 many schools in economics. But, but the problem is that unlike any other social science where they teach the philosophers, those students, first two years about other methodological approaches to the same problem, or at least they teach them the history so that they can see that in the time of the Plato we believe this, but then we believe that, and everybody believed this in the Middle Ages. And uh, it was not that it was stupid to believe, it was that everybody, but our beliefs will also be stupid 200 years down the line, for sure. Yeah. But uh, you can't say it, you have to wait 200 years just to say this. But obviously it's clear, it's always been that. Uh, um, but uh, so this is, in this I'm preparing. But the very way you structure the question itself is, well, let me give a stupid example. Today, for example, we use GDP to measure the quality of a nation. Um, we, GDP is in a way a remnant of nationalism. So, okay, GDP looks like a hard fact, yeah? Number, uh, undisputable. All the criticism of the soft say, yeah, this is too soft, we need something hard. So, yeah, I'm going to attack now the hardness of GDP. This is the golden cow of economics. GDP, growth especially, yeah? Um, GDP is a remnant of nationalism. We no longer measure the largeness of a nation in geographical growth, but in economic growth. And it's a remnant of something that is completely random. Just imagine if we measured GDP regionally. In this case, the Greek debate would not be Germany versus Greeks, but some regions of Greece would be sending money to some regions of Germany, especially Eastern Germany because there are regions of Germany that are poorer than some regions in, uh, in Greece. What's important is that the whole Nazi Second World War debate would disappear, because immediately what people reverted to was Second World War. Why? Because we still use the same ideological constraint. If we, for example, another absurd idea, <coughs> let's measure GDP according to gender. Your mother would maybe like this. <laughs> So there, you would have, okay, the GDP of uh, men in 2014 went down by 3.4%, while the GDP of women went up by 3.9%. <clears throat> now, should the woman be fiscally solidary with these always lazy men? The same, the same debate we have Germany versus Greece would be female versus male. Will we be social transfers, da 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 But nobody would actually think, so the only way that we interpret certain facts this way is because we are used to it. So in this way, ideology is embedded and cannot not be embedded. This is my point. There is no, it's not possible to exit an ideological structure system. It's impossible. But we need to be aware that our ideology is, is, is randomly and unconsciously very often Suggested because these students don't get this choice. You can't calculate these equations if you don't believe in these assumptions that we've made. Otherwise, you can't do that. Well, I have just got one amendment. If, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. Um, I have just one amendment. So it's like, what you say in a case, for example, uh, uh, where you have a variable of ideology, so you have two variables, and the variable of uh, ideology stays constant. 
but the research or the find that I'm curious. That's a good question. The finding differentiates itself because the, when Friedman was explaining the Chicago School uh, evolved evolution, he said actually that uh, the Chicago School in the 19th century and sort of the beginning of the 20th century was more of a left leaning uh, university. And his teacher, Jacob Weiner, uh, taught in the methodology that he used also, uh, was actually more of a left leaning economist. But the empirical the studies of the Chicago School throughout the 20th to the 20th century uh, shifted more out of the left uh, spectrum. Although the uh, previous said that the methodological part of the Chicago School stayed the same, almost the same uh, throughout all the century. Yeah. So the core yeah. was the same that the left wing economists uh, used, yeah. but the curiosity to, to somehow the pile of research yeah. was adding up and the economists shifted their opinion. But this happens in every religion. Where? In Christianity. <laughs> Everywhere, in Islam, every, every religion, every ideology, <laughs> communism also went through empirical uh, tests that, that it failed, but it's still around. And Christianity, I mean, what now, 200 years ago, we would kill each other because the way we put water on babies. Today, you can do, I don't know, drown it in chocolate. It doesn't really matter. But 200 years ago, people were literally killed for it. If you worked on Shabbat, you got stoned. I mean, uh, with stones. Stone, not with stones. Everybody saw you were having to get stoned. Okay. But you can't have the Pope and the authority to. Yeah, but look at, compare the last two Popes. Compare Francis with the other guy. Ratzinger. I mean, suddenly it, it, a lot of things are okay. Uh, so beliefs change, of course. Some, some, somebody, somebody converts from left to right. Somebody converts from Christianity to Buddhism and back, or whatever. Catholic Protestants. And I think by Christianity there is enough room to move for the whole life without even anything in one structure, but that's not the thing. If the methodology stays the same, we cannot say that um, economics is always polluted by ideology. Yeah, it, it, I mean, again, I'm saying it's impossible to exit the ideological structure. Even in physics, there are, there are, there are ideologies. For example, that the speed of light is constant. This is recently by empirics shown that this is not always so. Um, but if this would be true, I mean, yeah. So some science is more open for new ways of looking at it. Some science is rather closed for new ways. So let's say my wife is a sociologist, and they are rewriting sociological books because they have internet, for example. And that changes the whole thing. The whole shabang is different than the textbooks that were written 20 years ago. You have Twitter, you have social media, you have revolutions made on the internet. So it has to be changed. Our textbook, economics, huh, what, so, what? There's something happening in the world. We, who consider ourselves to be the progressive, you know, we look down on sociologists and all the other sort of conservative, rustically romantic, you know, left in the sort of this image of a family happily, you know, dancing around the fireplace. That's the sort of the sociologist mythology of this, you know, ideal rustic classical family with which they compare everything. Uh, but we always thought of ourselves that we economists are the progressive ones. No, I mean, no. Internet, these, these, these things that are, capitalism has changed, this is what Schumpeter said, capitalism 20 years ago, here in Slovenia, I'm quite sure, just like in Czech Republic, was completely different from today. Uh, capitalism 200 years ago was different from capitalism today. This is the, this is the nice thing about capitalism, that it, that it changes. And I, just to, not to be confused, I don't criticize capitalism because I hate it. I criticize, like a movie critic doesn't hate movies. <coughs> I criticize capitalism because I, 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 I think it can be done better and that um, it's, it's a system that deserves to be criticized because it energizes and moves by criticism. Look at the Green Movement. 20 years ago, it was a joke. Nobody took it seriously. Today, it's a very serious political force, business force, and even a personal force. Nobody cleans cars and rivers anymore. We used to do that like nobody would be able to care. So I have to, I have to, sorry, I have to give take one last question. But really quickly. Yeah, I'll give it a You're talking about the numbers, you know, whatever, criteria. Can you imagine, like, if you ever imagine a currency, like, use the blockchain? Use the what? Blockchain, blockchain. Yeah. Blockchain to add descriptions, like, so that people would 
like the feedback, which would be the currency, although it wouldn't be comparable in such a way, but isn't that an illusion? Would that work in a, in a way? Can you imagine the switch of currency? Yeah, I mean, the whole nature of currency will also change. It will go more into printing it sort of uh, in a 